Um, all right. Hello, it's Sarah Lambert here and I am speaking to you from Melbourne um, on um, the, the land of the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nations and I'd like to acknowledge our Indigenous um, First Nations people who um, have sovereignty over this land. So with thanks to Elders past, present and future and everyone who is um, here to join us today to launch our open education and social justice special collection of Jime. I'm so excited to see all of your lovely faces and comments and um, of the authors and um, uh, numerous collaborators on this um, beautiful collaborative project that we have been working on now since um, we first chatted in July 2018, Laura and I. So it's been um, one of those long gestations of um, much joy. So um, I wanted to um, first of all uh, hand over to Angela to to welcome and, and um, add her perspective. Um, it's been a great joy to have some extra support from the, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation um, and um, it's just been allowed us to do so much more than we could have and I'm eternally grateful for Laura's guidance and ideas um, uh, having experienced um, this kind of project before, um, that this would be a really um, great way to put social justice into our project in the way we ran it. And I think that's just been um, one of those core ideas. And it, you know, was, it wasn't something, I wanted to do this publishing project. Laura said, okay, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it well. And it just shows you how important collaboration and the strength of everyone's ideas is um, that you can come together and, and do something um, different. So, so um, Angela, uh, from the Hewlett perspective, would you like to provide a welcome and a bit of a, an intro? That would be just delightful. Yeah, happy to. And am I coming through okay? Is it clear? Okay, great. Um, well, I, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm really glad to be here and I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I really want to hear from the authors and um, and the rest of the com have a lot of time for the rest of the conversation. Um, I'll start by saying that the work reflected in this journal is so needed. Uh, I think that we all know that open is not the same as equitable and inclusive. And even if we agree that we all care about equity, inclusion, and social justice as part of our work in, in open education, we need theory and grounded examples to inform our thinking and our growth, uh, to deepen and improve practice, and to push the field forward. And I think it's so important in the development of this special issue that there was such intentionality about bringing together a uh, diversity of perspectives globally to really explore these intersections. And this work is so important too for our, our new uh, open education strategy at the Hewlett Foundation. Um, we're much more explicit now that the focus is not just about the resources themselves, but changing how teaching and learning happen and supporting the field to be more responsive to the diversity of educators, students, and learners today. So I'm really excited to hear more from the authors and hopefully continue to learn together through your work. So congratulations to, to all of you through, in this publication. Thank you. I feel like I needed to have some canned applause on hand for when you finish speaking, but I, I just imagine that it's going to be like a, a yes, a little a wavy clap. I feel like it's like the official launch. I, I um, yes, exactly. Woo, we did it. <laughs> and um, when I was trying to find a way to do this launch virtually, it was like, uh, can we have like some virtual ribbon cutting or champagne popping moment? <laughs> and in the end, I've just, I've reduced down to a nice festive feeling um, Zoom background. <laughs> but if that was the moment, I would have smacked a, a bottle of champagne over the side of some virtual object. <laughs> it would be great. Um, I'm going to paste the URL to the collection in the sidebar and I'm going to um, hand over to Laura, who's going to, run forward with the um, with the pres with the formalities, which will be great. Laura, I just thought you might want to go first and I would go after you, but what do you reckon? 
I reckon um, it would be great if you could haul out those slides, Sarah, the ones that we had a miscommunication about. Ah, uh, you want me to share my screen of them? Yeah, if you could do that, because there it. is, I have actually, I actually have laid out a program there, so. Okay, people, we are on it. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking people. I don't know what's possible. What do you reckon? <laughs> I'll hit share. Uh, and then we're going for this. Yep. Um, how about we do that? Okay. It's loading. It's loading. Yay. Okay. How about that? All right. Um, so, all righty. Um, opening remarks. That would be me. So, um, wonderful. So, here we okay. have, the, my goodness, yeah. all the papers. Go for it. Laura, chip in. No, it's just, I'm, I must say, when I put these, I, I won't talk now, I'll just say a few things at the end, but just look at that. Just okay. stop for a minute mm. and look at that. Mm. I was so it, I know. It was an amazing moment when we saw how um, the press had pulled together all 11 articles and our editorial. And indeed, the editorial was um, um, not a... Um, not a, we didn't do one of those short pieces that just said, oh, there's 11 articles and they're all rather lovely. Um, we did actually put in quite a bit of effort to, to give some meat and, our, and add some value um, from um, the perspective of what it's like to do um, this process. And um, also, I was really interested and, and I'm just so passionate to work with all the authors around the theory, the theorising behind all of these papers and what, how do we think through social justice and how does that add value to the work that we do and make it applicable in lots of different contexts. And so um, there is a theory map that I produced Use to to try and prove uh, try and give like a helicopter view of those theory, theoretical approaches and the different types uh, of way of doing. Um, Laura, I think we might have yes. Yeah. This is the first one I did. <laughs> um, so I started off well, reading all of those papers and of course yes. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say it, it. There was a bit of a lag, but it's now popped up. Beautiful, yes. Um, it was just so rich to see um, the different theories and the different ideas and, and the sim some similarities and links and some really fresh approaches. And so I started to want to come to grips with this and um, develop a, a theory map of all of the um, theoretical contributions with all special edition. By producing this, that I can make another contribution of a different kind of synthesis of of what's been achieved. Um, so the theory map is is talking, and it's it's what you know is in the editorial about these theories coming from the big field of of sociology and and um, so cultural studies and economic philosophy, and how these have been filtered down more specifically for education a lot more recently, and how this is starting to appear in our works. Um, I'm going to just move forward to where this map ended up. When this comes clear on your screen, is it uh, come yet? Yeah. Yes. Great. All right. So this is the large picture of where the theory map ended up as published in the editorial. And so what you will see is I've attempted to position um, each of the papers in the, in the special edition and, and which sort of island of uh, philosophy they <laughs> come from. And of course, you must necessarily exclude more than you can include in, in one of these snapshots. But there was a strong um, uh, use of Fraser and her economic, cultural and political um, dimensions there and linkages to other authors who also cite her. Um, there was a lot, a number of people 
then um, referencing myself and uh, Cheryl Hodgkins and Williams and Henry Trotter's work in 2018. Uh, and as I said, it's just that um, there's more people now making the translation from the broader how this plays out in society to the narrower how this plays out in education. And I think this is where we're starting to really engage. So you can see through the arrows, lots of cases who are directly referencing Fraser um, Lambert, Hodgkins and Williams Trotter. Some are using them directly as a structure in their work and others a little more um, remotely as more of an approach, I suppose. Um, uh, some are um, also merging with other kinds of critical theory uh, and that will become clear as we hear from the authors. Some drawing on digital divide theory, some um, from social inclusion theory. So I, I'm laying that all out in the editorial and I hope that that um, provides a, a sort of interesting reflection on, on how this work is developing and, and um, and cross fertilizing and it's just been such a rich set of cross fertilizations some some of the papers um, and the authors have drawn on new have drawn on two theories to bring a new one to the world it's it's really quite powerful and there's been some innovations in research open research methodology too in terms of some new experimental studies um, and also some reuse of open data sets so i hope you find that um, those editorial comments really useful and I know Laura said she will put some comments on um, later about about her take on it um, which will be great so that's pretty much all I really wanted to say is just to, to point out that that's in there and I hope that it's useful um, how do we go forward beautiful all right Okay, so, so shall we move on to the authors? Yeah. All right. So I am um, going to hand over to Johanna Funk first and then Tuskeen, although you may, you may, um, it sounds like you might have decided to do this together. Totally over to you two for the microphones and I am going to put myself on mute and really enjoy what you have. Thank you. Uh, Tuskeen and I got together over WhatsApp earlier this week and had a little chat and developed something together. So just confirming that we have between five and 10 minutes for the, for the both of us. Is that correct? That's correct. That, cool. Perfect. Okay. Lovely. Well, um, again, I would like to acknowledge uh, the elders past and present. I'm on Larrakia country up here in Darwin. Um, but also I want to acknowledge the, uh, the involvement of my supervisor, Dr. Kathy Guthajaka, who oversaw a lot of my PhD studies um, and with a lot of her knowledge and many of the other elders and uh, more experienced people that we work with. Um, um, I just, I think that that's a real, um, something that is very important to think about every day that we do this work. Um, and thanks again to Jime and the editorial staff and that wonderful session at OER 19 last year. Um, really has been such a cool thing. Um, the mentorship that is, was enabled through the Hewlett Foundation, I got to say that was incredibly helpful to, uh, to get um, the level up uh, from, from what we were doing. Um, uh, at the PhD level. I mean, I was just finishing up my PhD in the last six months. So it was amazing to have the support one on one, not just a workshop that was generic. So that was really hugely supportive. And I'd really like to see more of that um, in the future if it's possible. It was really great. Um, and then contribute to it. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say thanks to, to everyone. Taskeen and I have developed a couple of themes that we're going to share and um, a, a little bit of a collaborative presentation. So over to you, Tuskeen. Thank you, Jana. And yeah, just to echo Jana's sentiments, thank you um, to Sarah, to Laura, to everyone who's just put so much effort into getting this publication out. And um, one of the themes that Johanna and I both um, emphasize in our work is justice as process. And I just wanted to reflect a little bit in terms of how this um, special edition came to be, because um, both Johanna and I received help from mentorship, and I think that was very much an inclusive process for both of us who are still writing PhDs, uh, and this was one of the first papers I've written. It was an incredibly inclusive process to have, um, have the opportunity to have a mentor support me throughout the writing process, and it really does help 
um, early career researchers. So um, thank you for that. And I definitely think it was a, a good investment to, to help the process of this um, journal be more inclusive. Um, so some of the themes, Jana and I decided to present together today because um, we found a lot of overlapping themes between our work. And the first one was who defines what openness is and what justice is. Um, Jana focused on you know, definitions of openness. Um, mine were looking at definitions of justice and um, looking at the dominance of Western epistem epistemologies in um, defining these themes. And basically, yeah, who, who decides um, what knowledge is? Um, and uh, one of the themes that came across as well is um, perhaps that you could decolonize, indigenize, and still have an em enormous amount of injustice. So yeah, so we saw these overlaps between our um, papers and we thought that they'd present together. Um, yeah, could you move to the next slide, please? And uh, Johanna, you can take over. Okay, so some of you will be familiar with some of these images. I'm few resources represented in this um, paper. And so I'm going to move from the uh, magazine covers on the left hand side of the screen in a clockwise direction to the aquaculture and uh, fisheries stuff and then down to um, Guta's or Kathy Guta Jaka's um, Jodhwir um, authorship. Now how, how these things um, presented in terms of their social justice. Um, I, I use the term knowledge authority to really center um, the, the, the practice that is local here and the, 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 uh, the understanding of people authoring their knowledge on their own terms with their own language, but with the use of some various levels of openness and platforms. Um, so people are exercising that knowledge, sovereignty and authority, and it's not something that is a, a, as an outcome. So I've, I'm still thinking about this as something as a moving process that is a continual. And that kind of performance of, of openness um, is, has helped things be fluid and um, helped me to understand these things. So moving from these magazine covers is a workforce development. So that helps restructure employment um, in the indigenous employment and workforce development from um, uh, centering people in positions of authority, as you can see, um, to indigenous run aquaculture and fisheries businesses that have been going for thousands of years, but have now, you know, using Western um, business sense processes to help them. Um, and then, you know, con deciding how they want to license their uh, resources as well as, as uh, they feel comfortable with the intellectual and, um, and scientific labor that they're doing and sharing with the rest of the world. Um, and the amplification of language and knowledge in Gutha's um, authorship, again, uh, recenters and restructures her, the, the, the kind of worth of her cultural capital were not necessarily a financial um, outcome, but in that contentious uh, scientific um, digital world. Um, again, the cultural uh, recognition and reacculturation of opening dialogue between Western um, ideas of workforce um, and economic participation and success uh, virtu versus the indigenous authorship of what work might mean to people out on country in very remote communities and how that melts into the local ontologies and um, kinship structures that uh, govern uh, how people live. Um, the ways that that recognition of ancient fisheries and aquaculture um, practices, for example, um, continue to be meaningful employment that can help people be self-sustaining self and self-determining on their country according to their um, traditional and homeland uh, territories. Um, and uh, getting science to work for indigenous knowledge, um, claiming digital territory with uh, the clan um, uh, membership of different sightings, for example, what Guta did. And finally, the political representation that uh, uh, is demonstrated here is, is that uh, there's an indigenous defined context and a changing of parity of participation from a real deficit narrative around indigenous employment and economic participation to a real opening a dialogue about what 
what you could do if you wanted to have a different kind of uh, financial existence in your community, what um, you know, some of the options might be. Um, and situating knowledge um, and keeping keeping that knowledge on country and showing people how uh, we practice um, knowledge on on country and you know utilize the Western institutional tools to um, promote and amplify people's um, practices. So um, yeah, I just wanted to um, share how some of those resources um, measured up to the frameworks in the social justice. Uh, literature that I got to engage with and um, it was a really nice way to demonstrate um, people exercising their knowledge authority. Cool I've just had to move onwards we just have a couple of minutes left so yeah. Yeah. Tuskeen, hey, so go for it. Upon what um, Johanna said um, basically I wanted to look at broader understandings of justice beyond um, Western concept or, or more um, yeah, conceptions of justice uh, from the West. So my research um, looked at 20, uh, 27 MOOC designers from South Africa and I um, interviewed them and asked them questions about their approaches to uh, justice and their conceptions of justice. And what I found from this is that actually words like just, social justice and decolonization have really a multiplicity of meanings. And to just use the word like that actually doesn't have much meaning until you interrogate what someone means behind it. Um, and so, yeah, for example, one of my interviewees said that, you know, you could have, um, you could decolonize and still have an enormous amount of injustice. Then on the other hand, if you look at decolonial scholars, um, they are actually like born in contestation uh, with the idea of like the Eurocentric frameworks that define what human values are. Um, and so, that's what um, led me to building this framework, which actually took a step back and looked at the social justice frameworks, but also drew on decolonial thought to understand so, uh, justice, the idea of justice from different perspectives. And I came up with these three lenses, um, which, which somewhat neatly overlap with the latest social justice frameworks um, from Sarah and from uh, um, Hodgkinson, Williams, and Trotter, and et cetera. So um, what I found was that um, the MOOC designers had various uh, varying interpretations of justice. And those that focused on material injustices emphasized um, socioeconomic disparities, infrastructural issues, and systemic problems, um, you know, um, based on, you know, for example, geographic location. And um, those that focused on cultural epistemic injustices um, emphasize the importance of inclusiveness, of relevance, and of the geopolitics of knowledge. So something that was quite important in this framework was emphasizing the epistemic angle, because um, often when we talk about the cultural angle, um, you could have, you know, different races or different uh, nationalities at the table, but everybody could be thinking in the same way. And so emphasizing that epistemic angle, that including different ways of thinking, like Johanna had mentioned, um, was really important to us. Thanks. Okay. That's Next, yeah. really fantastic. Um, so we ended up with a, a new framework. So um, we'll have to move fairly quickly, but just a, a minute here, if you wouldn't mind, Tuskeen. Thank you. Um, yeah, Johanna, do you just want to... Oh, okay, I can, I can summarize for both of us. I think the, the main point was that, um, yeah, social justice is not just an outcome, it's really a process and, and it needs to um, have inclusivity from the conception and it needs to include um, different uh, people, different ways of being, different ways of knowing. And yeah, from my research in particular, um, it's really important to highlight these different perspectives for um, designers of open content so that they can address the material, cultural, epistemic, and geopolitical inequalities um, in education and in online open education. Thanks. Fascinating stuff. A couple, you know, this. I hope that what we're trying to achieve here is, of course, giving the authors an opportunity to speak, but also to give the participants a little taste of the kinds of things that um, they can dig into in in this. 
Um, absolutely. So now we'd like to um, open the floor for Maha and her um, collaborators, although I think Maha, you might be speaking. Um, and so um, a wonderful paper about open educational practices, which also um, was um, thinking about a framework. Um, so in the way that Tuskeen um, produced a new framework, which is always a great research tool for future thinking in, in design and research, um, a great contribution there. Um, uh, so to um, Bali, uh, Cronin and Jane Gianni have um, really investing time in, in providing better thinking tools for practice and for research. And um, so please, um, Ma Maha, please take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad that Catherine and Rajiv are here. Um, and so jump in, you guys, if, if you want to at any point. Um, I'm turning off my videos because uh, sound is cutting up for me a little bit. So can we move on to the next slide? So we're talking about framing open educational practices from a social justice perspective. And we're building off of two things. Um, and our, the main reason we did this is we thought it would be useful <clears throat> to include an inclusive typology of open educational practices um, because of all those uh, sort of conversations about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, includes a lot of uh, quite a diversity of different practices and so we were sort of dividing them across continuum of openness along three axes uh, and that builds off of work that I did in 2017 and then we're also adding the social justice focus which builds on the work of Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and, and William Trotter and talking about how a particular open educational practice um, can support social justice along any of the three dimensions of economic cultural and political uh, reform and also looking at how it works in context and then whether that kind of reform is transformative, ameliorative, neutral, or even negative. Um, and so the next slide will show one of those dimensions, like the sort of the framework. Can we move on, please? Who's, who's got control of the slides? We need to move Sarah. on. Next. There it is. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, and so you're gonna have to click the first time around. So first of all, we look at uh, open educational practices that are either more content centric or process centric. And this sort of builds on curriculum theory is that a curriculum can be based on content or outcomes or process. And with OEP specifically, there's some that are focused around OER and content itself and others that are more about the process of openness. Uh, the next dimension, access is can you click please yes so they can be either centered around the teacher or they can be centered around the learner and they can also either be done for a pedagogical purpose or a social justice purpose and of course within the social justice i think we need to click one more time within the social justice part it can be um, on those cultural economic dimensions and so on so we can actually go back. I don't need to use, I don't think the annotation, I don't know if the annotation tool works here. Would people be able to annotate if we stayed here? So I, I actually want to involve uh, participants and let's see, there's supposed to be at the very top of your screen something called view mm -hmm. options and something called annotate. I'm going to try it now and then see if you can do it as well. If not, you can write in the chat. So for example, if I give you an example of something called, uh, something like Wikipedia editing, is that more content centric or process centric or somewhere in between? What would you say? So if folks want to annotate, like you could click something like, yeah, you could also type and also, or also just put um, stars. If folks want to participate and do that, I want to discuss like Wikipedia editing as an example and think about in between. So Caroline Kuhn is saying in between. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's an interesting one, right? Because you're, you're doing content. But the, the emphasis is not on the output as much as on the process. If you're doing it as part of your class and you're teaching students about the process of how knowledge is created on Wikipedia, then it's more about that process. But it, of course, has a content outcome. Like everything has both. It's just that along the spectrum, um, where is the emphasis um, higher, right? And, and whether it's teacher or learner centric depends on how much control students have over what they're doing, right? But is it more of a pedagogical or a social justice one? Where would people put it? The spectrum is very small, isn't it? It's like very, very small part <laughs> to sort of lay out where, where you think it is. Where do folks think uh, Wikipedia editing lies on the social justice? Uh, 
I'm finding the text annotation really slow. I like the ticking that's going on. I think that is really an effective poll method. <laughs> <laughs> the typing was not good. <laughs> <laughs> we vote okay, so I'm ticks. finding a spectrum. I'm finding a spectrum of responses, which I think is really interesting about this one. So um, I, I want to hear from folks who feel like it's more towards pedagogical and, and from someone who thinks it's more towards social justice. So is it easier for people to type? Maybe not necessarily. So I like this not necessarily. I'm curious. Who yes, I would yeah. invite one of the not necessarily people to switch their mic on and just give us a, a little taste of your thought of your thinking. <laughs> Go ahead. I heard someone begin and then <laughs> not. <laughs> Someone's shy. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say what we talk about in our paper. So, oh, can't access your mic. That's sad, Catherine. I'm sorry. That's another like in the moment inequality that happens sometimes in, in video conferences. Um, do you want to type? I could say whatever you type. Um, so in our in our article we talk about how we talk about the kinds of inequalities that exist on Wikipedia so kind of like the majority male content the majority male editing so those are cultural and political injustices that exist within Wikipedia partly just because the education technology world is kind of like that um, and a lot of other things um, but then you can convert a Wikipedia editing experience into a more socially just experience with something like feminist hackathons, where you actually bring feminists together and you intentionally create more articles about women because Wikipedia has uh, fewer articles about women. So those are kinds of things, like it's the same uh, process, but you can make it more socially just by focusing on whose content becomes the thing that you work on, who is actually working and choosing the the, the biographies of the people and are these biographies of marginalized populations. And so that's how you can convert something into more socially just. Another example, I'm going to clear the annotations. I think I have the right to do that. It, yay, it works. All right, let's talk about something like hypothesis annotation, for example. If you're all familiar with this, so this is an open, and I think um, Amy Nussbaum, I think, um, no, not Amy Nussbaum, someone else. Someone else who's not here probably wrote an article about annotation for this um, issue. Monica Brown, thank you. Monica, Sorry. Monica and, and her yes, um, yeah. collaborator, Ben. Oh my goodness. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to that later. Right, Sorry, so Caroline Kuhn mind. is saying, that's okay. So Caroline is saying that it depends on who's leading the annotation and how they do it. It needs intentionality for something like collaborative annotation to be more socially just, right? Because you could end up, uh, for example, first of all, you can end up always annotating canonical works by white males. So that would not be a very, or you could always, um, and you can also approach it from a non-critical perspective, right? I mean, you could annotate the work of white males from a critical perspective, that would be more towards social. Um, and then there are also things about you know, how you organize an activity, for example, by timing. Like if you organize it at like a very late time, Pacific time in the US, that will exclude, you know, Europe and Africa from just joining if you make it for just one hour, for example. Uh, yeah, I think so too, Caroline. I think annotating a male text from a feminist perspective would then turn it into that. That's why I was saying you can annotate it with a critical perspective, that helps. So, so one of the examples that we give in our paper for this is, the work uh, of the marginal syllabus. Um, so Ramey, Kalir, and a few other people have worked on this. So it's, it's about deciding to annotate particular content that is from a critical perspective in the first place. Um, and then they initially used to do it as a one hour annotation activity, but they extended it to two days or something like that so that more time zones would be able to participate. So those are, it's about this intentionality, again, like Caroline Kuhn was talking about, um, is that if you, I was just talking about this yesterday, if you don't intentionally design in the social justice, it's probably not gonna happen by coincidence. So you have to think about all these things and keep iterating on, on your practice. And I think that's the same with, um, with open educational practice. I'll say one more um, open educational practice, which is virtually connecting. And this is one of the ones where context really matters in whether it, it is 
uh, it's definitely more process centric. It's definitely centered around the participants. But in terms of pedagogical versus social justice, uh, it can context the, and looking at those three different dimensions is really helpful because, you know, on the economic side, if someone doesn't have access to a strong enough internet to hold a synchronous call, they're already excluded and it's a negative thing for them. It's one more thing that they can't participate in. And a lot of the marginalized populations are already in that camp. Um, and then also a situation like virtually connecting can be not transformative if it's just reproducing the same um, capital that happens at conferences. And it can be uh, culturally and politically disempowering if um, the people who are making the decisions are the same people who are holding the conferences rather than marginal populations deciding what kind of conversations they want to have. Um, so I'm going to stop here because I think I've probably gone, uh, taken up my time. Uh, I just want to ask Catherine and Rajiv if they, they want to add something. Because I'm glad they're here. If there's time, if there isn't, we can I just want to say thank you to you, Maha, and, um, and to everyone, particularly Sarah and uh, Laura. That was a super job and a quick summary, so thank you. All right. I'm now um, going to turn some annotating off because at the moment, instead of moving the slides on, I'm just madly clicking all over. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that slide is going to slow you down. That's all right. I'm getting there. All right. So um, thank you very much. Now I'm going to hand over to Jacob Jenkins to talk on the bar on behalf of his author team about <clears throat> his study. And um, Jacob, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. I was going to get a timer going to help myself. Yeah, thanks, Sarah and Laura and Hewlett and everyone, of course, behind the scenes for making this possible. And uh, I want to thank everyone here. I feel like I'm like sitting ringside in an all-star game or something with everyone that I'm seeing over here and hearing from. This is great and open movement. And then here you can see on this screen, I should thank and put a shout out to the number of co-authors that I know at least one or two of them are uh, with us here right now listening in. So thanks a lot, Jamie. And Luis and a few other people if you are here. Our uh, study, as you can maybe tell from the subtitle, looked at textbook affordability as a social justice issue, which goes along with the special issue, of course. But more specifically, it was looking at the impact of textbook costs on historically underserved students. And some of you, I suspect in a group like this, you're all you know, extremely aware of prices and aware of adoption rates and you're, on, you're in tune with all these things, but there might be one or two of you that if you're anything like me, were surprised to learn that there are really, there's a dearth of studies that look specifically at textbook affordability um, issues along those lines within historically underserved student populations. And when we first started this project gathering the data, in fact, we could find zero articles published that specifically were looking at historically underserved students. And then by the time we collected our data and really got everything together, there, a Colbert's article uh, et al. 2018 came out, uh, which is you know a great article looking at a similar topic. And again, the point being, this was really, um, you know, a, our, a topic that really we felt like need to be look in, looked into. Because oftentimes, I guess, maybe it's even assumed that this population can help uh, be helped the most from open education resources from the affordability aspect, but there was just no empirical evidence out there, very, you know, big lack of it. So uh, just really quickly, I mean, I can tell you a little bit about the methods. I don't want to spend time there because you all can read things for yourself, but then I'll just tell you what we found because, uh, you know, even though in an in a odd way, uh, academic way, we were excited uh, to actually have significant results, you know, to show that this is an important issue. And then ultimately a little bit of discussion. So the methods, the only thing I wanted to mention uh, to not spend time there would just be that we're a Hispanic serving institution, uh, four year public uh, university. Uh, we surveyed over 700 students. And so that's about 7% of our overall population. And we got a general representative sampling um, and I can tell you more, and of course the method section tells you more, but maybe that gives you a little bit of an idea of where some of this data even came from. And then we were looking at it, like I already said, looking at some of these issues and some of these questions we were asking specifically for historically underserved students. So we were looking at low income students, uh, racial ethnic minorities, first generation college students. Those were our three major categories because yet again, being a Hispanic serving institution, they also align very well with our own student body. 
And this is the only slide since we were asked to only send a few slides. This was the one slide I sent that you're seeing now with uh, some of the results. This is obviously for first generation students and it had the most statistical significance. I should mention really quick, if I can look at my own cheat sheets, that you know all of the data was uh, compelling, we felt. You know, if you even looked at the entire student population, if you looked at all of the results rather, not uh, including non-first generation, including all incomes, all race ethnicities, 90% reported stress levels uh, on a scale from one to 10, like a type, the average was 7.0. 80% uh, of all students said they uh, had not had their textbook on the first day of class, 65%. Uh, reported not buying the textbook at all because of cost and I could I'm looking at this list I'm not even going to go down the whole list it continues along that line uh, ten, almost 10 percent of all students uh, reported failing the class due to textbook costs you know back to the idea of maybe not buying the textbook to begin with and then hence down the line failing so that kind of gives you an idea so then we specifically were looking at race ethnicity um, low income status and first generation status. And with the uh, race ethnicity, we were only able to look at the Latinx students and compare it to white students simply because of the, uh, you know, the, the demographics of our campus. We didn't have a large enough sample size for some of the other race ethnicities or any of the other race ethnicities. But to give you a little bit of an idea that's not on these slides, um, what 85% uh, versus uh, of white, of, uh, white students versus 91% of Latinx students reported uh, high stress levels. Um, it was also statistically significant when it came to first day access, uh, the amount of students that avoided buying a book, the amount of failure rates when you're looking at race ethnicity. It was a similar story with low income. And then the most statistical significance though was here with the first generation student, which is a slide you've seen for a little bit here. And that's the reason I sent that one along. So at least you could visualize some of the numbers because it can be confusing. I know someone's just talking about them. But as you can see for yourself here, these are uh, all statistically significant. And you can read for yourself that he has a stress, first day access, having it um, at all, you know, not buying the textbook because of cost, knowing beforehand that it was going to hurt their performance. You know, almost 50% of first generation students just knew that going in, but that's the reality they feel like they live in. Um, and then when you're talking about avoiding class, the last line there, you can see that obviously speaks directly almost twice as high percentage wise with first generation. And so that speaks directly to time to graduation rates, things like this, which also gets into student debt and a number of other things that we talked about in the discussion section. So you could switch to the next slide. Maybe I think I'm essentially out of time already, but with the discussion then we, so we feel like this was arguably the second or, you know, one of the only studies that we could find that it specifically looked at empirical data of historically underserved students and textbook affordability. So then we were really trying to use that data to flesh out that why this is a social justice issue. And so some of the you know basic ideas that are obvious to many of you on here I know is the idea of access in general. If 85% of faculty report uh, that students have to buy their textbook in order to pass the class, but then you have a statistically significant likelihood of certain student populations not having that book, then that just correlates to those same students have a statistical correlation of not passing the class, not succeeding. So we're setting up this barrier for a certain population. And then not only access, but then first day access, if you just continue as you can read for yourself, it's uh, I think someone else that's even on this call right now talks about, has a study that talked uh, about 70% of students rating access as being uh, one of the most, if not the most important aspect of a textbook. Um, and then, and then, you know, continuing on that long term implications, uh, some of the arrows are off a little bit there, but with uh, every 10% of student debt that goes up that correlates to a decrease of 2% home ownership likelihood. Uh, every five, uh, every five thousand dollars in student debt is a decrease of 5% of students pursuing their desired career. And if you unpack that, it's an interesting idea because they might be locked into the job that they're in right now and some things like that. So the reason there's a correlation there. And on the flip side, if you're debt free, it's, it correlates to 138% more likely to pursue a master's, 100% more toward retirement at the age of 30 if you graduate college from debt free. So there's just a number of ways of looking at this from a social justice element whenever it's we now have empirical data that shows it's a greater hardship for student populations, for certain student populations, and that affects their overall access, first day access, and even the long term implications. And uh, so ultimately, if I had more time, we could unpack this for days about the, uh, about the, I don't know, maybe false meritocracy that we see in higher education and how this is an issue that uh, 
we should all take on and with open education resources being one of the avenues to do that. Thank you so much. I think um, the discussion and implications section of this paper is really powerful and I really can um, be able to read. Uh, in fact, all, all of the papers have strong recommendations for practice, strong um, connections to uh, implications. These are really strong set of papers and I, I thank you for taking us through this one, Jacob, because you've really um, drilled into some of these implications that um, are really important for us to discuss. Um, it is really great um, to to hear about that one and I'm going to move over to Suzanne now who is going to talk about a case study. Uh, no, actually, wrong note cheat sheets it's a systematic review so a, a systematic review of gender what an amazing undertaking um, a, another very powerful method Suzanne please um, give us a yes, few hi everyone words. are you able to hear me well thumbs up perfect <laughs> yes okay great yes um, so I don't have slides for you so this will be just a chat with you um, so, okay, our article, um, 30 Years of Gender Equality, Inequality and Implications on Curriculum Design and Open and Distance Learning. So this has been a collaboration with uh, Tuba Buster from Ankara University, um, Hassan Uchar and Aras Boskurt from Anadolu University, and Engin Karahan from Osman Gazi University. So we're all Turkish colleagues and we work together on this. Um, everyone contributed in really unique ways. So this was a really great collaboration. Um, it's one of those studies, we worked a long time on it. Um, it was a very long study, at times quite difficult, but I'm really glad um, we started this. Um, I say started because it can only be a starting point for us. Um, many of you who are familiar with some of the things we're talking about in the article, um, won't find it difficult to understand what we're talking about. But I think for some others, um, we might need to elaborate on some of the concepts, so which is something we're considering doing in the near future. So special thanks to Laura and Sarah, of course, for their uh, feedback, support and everything. And also um, special thanks to Henry Trotter. Um, his review of our article was really um, helpful, not only for the mechanics of the paper, um, because none of us are native English um, speakers, but also because um, his feedback really contributed to the integrity of the paper I found. So that was really, really um, useful. So, so Henry um, was your mentor, is that right, Suzanne? Um, he wasn't really a mentor. We didn't, um, we didn't ask for mentorship, but he was, he, he kind of acted like a reviewer, but a yes. very careful, detailed, thorough yes. reviewer. So I'm really making, making the point because the the range of tasks of support that the um the grant provided we we called mentorship in a but it's a very broad term that actually covers a lot of different tasks and i guess i wanted to just be clear that um the review um in naming your reviewer you weren't you weren't naming your blind peer reviewer <laughs> so we didn't have any weird we didn't have any of that people know i just wanted to clarify then that that it, it came under the umbrella of the mentorship that was um supported and yes yeah, some um mentors um as laura will tell you about you know that the activity came late after the actual blind peer review process and that was very popular so sorry i just wanted to clarify in case people were confused <laughs> no go problem, ahead now um, and i found the, the um, open review process with henry really really useful which made me think okay blind review for something is really useful but that openness that transparency is also very very useful because we could go back and forth uh, with things so if we had a question about some of you know, one of Henry's comments, we could ask directly because we were using a Google document. So everything was transparent, very open. You know, it's a bit like the um, peer review process hybrid pedagogy is using. Um, so I think it's really, um, you can only do good things with it, right? When the, when the feedback is open and transparent and it's collaborative and discussion based. Okay, so going back to the article and what we did, um, I'd like to tie some of the things we did with what you said, you know, um, this morning for me <laughs> so far. Um, like Angela, um, at, I hope I'm pronouncing the right name right. Um, at the beginning of this chat, she mentioned how open education is not just about resources themselves. Um, and I think after this research, um, we agree, I agree with Angela's comments even more so. Um, because for many people working actively in this field in open and online education, 
um, online education has never been about resources, just resources, right? Um, so people talked about support. Um, they talked about the ways in which resources um, are, are allocated, designed, delivered, um, pedagogical choices, educational communities. They also talked about how familiars, you know, um, fam <laughs> families this morning, sorry, <laughs> families, educational communities, um, local communities, regional realities impact, uh, impact learning. So I think um, many people talked about learning as a social uh, process, sociocultural process. So this is really important. And this is something we clearly um, saw in our research. Also related, um, as we were digging deeper into the articles, like halfway through the research, we found ourselves asking, you know, um, just like Taskeen and Joanna, um, how is open evolving and who is evolving it? And I think that's a very important question. Um, because our research suggests that there are many studies on social justice. Maybe they don't call it social justice, but there are many, many studies on equality, inequality. Um, but these have stayed on the margins of open and distance education literature. So it's really important to go back to that literature, um, the marginalized, you know, forgotten literature, and um, see the kinds of debates there, you know, the build on them. That's so important rather than reinventing the wheel. You know? um, so that's something, something we observed. Um, so this has been a really interesting um, research experience for us. Um, is there, are there any questions so far, by the way? I don't want to just keep on talking. And I'm losing my voice because it's so early in the morning. But <laughs> I can hear. I can hear um, that that is the case. And Laura, I don't know if you want to jump on the mic, um, but I, I was thinking we could probably ex you would probably intend to explain some of the mentoring in your closing remarks, or would would you or, you know like to mention it now? Yeah, no, I will do in in the closing remarks. Great. So okay. So if, then finish off. Yeah. Great. So if anyone has a burning question, we're going to park that for for Laura's. Um, <laughs> for Laura's chat about the process of review, but is there any other questions at this point? We might just take a couple before moving on to the next speaker. Absolutely. I'll just continue. Just a few more things I'd like to say. Um, just didn't want to get into a monologue for, because okay. it's yep. good to focus on these conversations. Okay, so um, really interesting cool. research experience for us. And the starting point was a very simple question. Um, how has gender inequality been studied in open and distance learning? And I wouldn't say we found anything new in the article. You know, I don't think we're presenting anything new. We're just looking at what um, has been said about this um, and giving you an overall picture and we're in kind of bringing the literature together. Um, so we did a literature review um, on women's studies in ODL. Um, we identified about 60 studies on this and then using Thornborn's inequality framework, we looked at the ways um, in which these papers were addressing inequality. Um, so we were following the footsteps of Laura um, on this. Um, the first I heard from Laura um, on Thornborn, you know, the inequality framework was on network learning conference in 2016, um, where she had a fascinating talk about high, um, social justice in higher education. So we were following her footsteps and you'll see the references to Laura in our work. So we also arrived at the conclusion at the end of the, um, towards the end of the discussion, that we need very clear pedagogical frameworks to tackle inequality um, on a curricular level. And this is something Maha talked about just this morning. Um, so you need to have a vision, a goal, um, something to work towards. Um, in, our, in our research, um, feminist pedagogy really was doing that. Um, um, technology wasn't seen as a solution to the problems, you know, people were having. Um, there was a critical perspective. So what we did, we identified feminist pedagogy, um, critical pedagogy, and culturally relevant or responsive pedagogy as some methods um, to tackle gender inequality. Um, and without that dimension, without that critical vision, um, so, you know, you might talk about inequality, but what you're offering in, in response could be just technology itself, you know, nothing else. So we really need to have these broader pedagogical ideas. Um, so yeah, oh, just one last comment. Um, we don't talk about this in the article, but we also saw, you know, with this research, we use a sociological framework and um, Sarah, you talked about this at the beginning of this chat. Um, 
sociology is really helpful to understand what inequality is and how you might be responding to that. Um, for far too long, I think, um, education work with its sister discipline, educational psychology. Like when I was doing my PhD, most of the theories I learned about and um, wrote into my work were from psychology, educational psychology. But I think we need more sociology in education and maybe um, a discipline, I don't know if there's a discipline like that, but educational sociology, is there a discipline like that? Is education doing just sociology or doing psychology and sociology or is it, is it all a bit confused? So I think <clears throat> this is another thing we definitely um, observed in the article in our research. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this was all over the place, but I hope it made sense. Oh, so rich. Um, comments are lovely. Um, I'm really loving to see the comments fly by about open review, about the need for um, this type of research, Suzanne, and, and about, um, yes, the theorising and the, the interdisciplinary nature of of how open education is is really, I think, starting, I agree with you, really starting to see a much stronger foundation because we are drawing on more than technology, more than and psychology, and all of those things have been an important component. But um, I really appreciated also a comment made earlier about how this special edition is is diverse in methodology as well, and and um, and that's a, a nice um, a nice way to think about um, the influences um, still cohabiting in this space and and everyone making a contribution. That's wonderful. Um, we need to move on to Gabby Woodhouse, who's our last author, before Laura then makes some comments. Um, now. I think I may have clicked a little too soon, <laughs> Gabby. Um, Sarah, hello. <laughs> yes, hello. Um, would you like to speak to the cutting the ribbon moment? <laughs> sorry, I, so sorry, I don't have a slide for you here. <laughs> All right, shall I share the slides then? If you can, that would be glorious. Okay. Yes. Before I do that, I just want to say that I am um, co-presenting with um, my co-author, Carolina Albuerna Rodriguez, um, also known as Caro. So I'm going to give the first couple of minutes just an intro, and then um, Caro will continue. Cool. Well, I've so stopped I'm sharing, just... so you can take up the sharing offer. Um, I'm just looking for my, the right screen to share. Be there in a sec. Um, oh, share. There. That should be right. Thank you so much. That's great. Okay. We'll take a breath Can and you just see? have a look. Right. <laughs> Can you see screen? our um, cover slide now? I certainly can. Thank you so right. much. So um, this was a collaboration between Kula Charitamas at the Open University, Caro Albuena Rodriguez from Refugee Action, and myself um, as a contract with the Open University and Karina Bosu also with the OU. Um, and it's called Advancing Social Justice for Asylum Seekers and Refugees in the UK, an open education approach to strengthening capacity through Refugee Action's Frontline Immigration Advice Project. Um, and um, that's called FIAP for short. But actually, I'm going to stick with that uh, cover slide for a moment and just give you a bit of an intro. Uh, so in this paper, we presented an analysis of this free online professional development and capacity building program. And it was developed by the charity Refugee Action. And the aim of the program is to strengthen the capacity of organisations working in the voluntary and community sector in the UK by training frontline workers to provide appropriate legal advice to people going through the immigration and asylum system. So organizations in this sector range in scale, structure, size of membership, culture, and mission. And the frontline workers who the program is aimed at bring a range of different backgrounds and skills to the table, and they're employed in a variety of roles, including caseworkers and advisors. Many of them are volunteers. 
So the Frontline Immigration Advice Programme included three elements. The first was expert, guide, expert guidance to organisational leaders. Um, the second is an on, a series of online learning programmes for frontline workers, which prepare participants to register with this government body um, as immigrant, immigration advisors at these two levels. Um, and they're very legally technical and complex um, content-wise. So they do require a quite in-depth um, study to, to pass these exams. Um, and then the third element was, or is, remains communities of practice, both online and offline for frontline workers. Now, the, the perhaps the, the most interesting element of this study for this community is um, the way in which openness was viewed. And actually, Refugee Action took a deliberate decision to limit openness to a specific target group um, and they did that for both practical and ethical reasons and I'm going to hand over now to Caro who is going to explain a bit more about that. Thank you Gabby, thank you for that great introduction and, and thank you um, to everyone really for having a, a non-academic in the bosom of this um, special edition but also um, in today's launch. I'm, I'm really grateful and as um, the daughter of, and granddaughter and great-granddaughter of teachers um, I always feel uh, very at home in this community but thank you for all the learning that I've done in the last few months and, and just in the last hour. Um, you, you are so, so very very welcome can I just say and it, it, this pro, this paper to have uh, a community collaboration meant a lot to us. It really, really did on a professional level. What it means for open education's diversity is not just about, you know, um, academics and in educational institutions owning this space either. I actually think this is really strong and um, yes, so just super duper welcome and thank you. <laughs> Um, and, it, and thank you. And, and as I said, you know, the learning that we have done as an organisation, me personally leading this team and sort of being the co-designer and, and manager, inverted commas, of, of, of our programmes, um, you know, all, all the learning that I've taken from, from open education and, and um, it's, like I'll say in, in, a, in, in my small few words, uh, it's, it's been a great validation for the work that we've been doing and um, to hear that people were already um, theorizing and, and analyzing and researching and coming to the same conclusions as us uh, through doing the work and, and, and reaching out to, to those people um, that we, we serve and work for. So yeah, as, as Gabby was saying, um, obviously this is openness within um, you know, with a caveat. Um, so the, I wanted to sort of um, share what I say to my team um, of four project managers when people refer to the work that we do in my capacity building team as a, um, you know, the training team, you know, we're the training team. And I, I say to them, you know, please try and reframe what, what you say because we don't just provide training. And every time you hear that from someone or you are the one explaining that's what we do, a fairy dies. You know, that sort of idea of um, Peter Pan and, um, and I, you know, they really clutched onto that. And, and this um, article has really helped me to um, put into words and explain what we mean by, you know, a fairy dies every time somebody says we just do training with that training team in the refugee sector in the UK. Um, and that brings us on, on to, to the reason why we don't just do training and, and why, you know, um, I think a few of the people on the conversation today have talked about um, learning and, and education being so much more than, than just, you know, the, the, the kind of um, tool of learning or the openness of, of the learning. For us, um, you know, the, the problem, as Gabby said, was that we had a, a sector which had um, decreased in terms of the legal advice that was available uh, to those vulnerable groups um, substantially. And we wanted to have more bumps on seats and more people who were able to advise within that really complex, fast changing um, 
legislation, which is our, our immigration law in the UK. Um, and how did we do that? So that capacity building um, um, model, that social impact model, obviously necessitated of learning, uh, but not learning on its own, which, um, you know, I think the the slide there um, that looks at how I really self-identified in, in our learning with the findings of Little John, uh, and I can't pronounce the Margarian, Margarian, I think, um, findings, you know, um, were really, really helpful to, to, to find ourselves in, you know, sort of explain through that. So, um, we, when we started thinking about um, what we needed to do, we obviously understood that training was what was going to get people to become registered advisors because people needed to pass this training. So we were working within a, a legal context that was very, very complex and fast paced. Um, we didn't really have the funds to just get more solicitors out there in the community. So we looked at what the assets um, were that already existed in the refugee sector in the UK and really thought, well, a lot of these people can be advisors themselves and can train through this program. Um, so the training that was out there wasn't sufficient, was expensive. Um, and often wasn't aimed at people that we were trying to reach, which were workers who had advice and welfare backgrounds, but didn't really have a legal specific um, training. Um, and like Gabby said, you know, through the work that the Open University's evaluation of our program did, they found that a lot of the people on the learning program found the, the subject matter quite taxing and, and very, very difficult. So obviously we needed to make sure that that learning um, was not just a, a good um, sort of syllabus, but also that we were providing organizations with um, that working practice support. So that third element there in, in uh, Little John's um, analysis, um, but not without thinking about the scalability of the issue, which obviously involved tech and involved um, online learning. So I guess, um, you know, going back to the question of openness, which obviously you're all experts in, and um, Gabby and I had a really great conversation about yesterday. Um, I guess, you know, why, why haven't we made this kind of a, a, a real open resource? Um, kind of boils down to the fact that we work within an ecosystem where there are already um, kind of open, um, uh, open access tools and information that people in the general public can get to in terms of blogs and, and toolkits um, around legal advice. Um, but what our aim was, was to create that, that professional capacity for there to be direct good quality advice um, to those groups. So working within that ecosystem, um, you know, we produced that model that Gabby showed earlier, which looks at not just the training, but also the organizational support that, so that organizations really understood that, you know, training their staff didn't just mean, you know, uh, legal advice happening and their services, but it meant that they needed to look at how they delivered services, needed to integrate support, um, you know, time for learning. Absolutely. I understand what you're saying. It's uh, it is it is open education, you know, um, and, and and in drawing this thread together, as we need to hand to Laura. I mean, what you're describing is absolutely what curriculum designers struggle with, and we all have the limitations of the tools that we have available to us, and um, and the levels of openness. And Catherine has written about this. It's it's always contested and negotiated and context driven. There is no one open. So your your model is is absolutely within. Um, within the camp, within the tent, and a really valuable contribution. And, and I really thank you for all of that. So um, it is Sorry. wonderful. Apologies. I just, uh, I lost the connection and I'm back now. I don't know what happened there. Oh, I, I'm I'm sorry. We we're um we're we've just thanked um thanked you both immensely, and I'm just about to um to to share the final um the final moment and ask laura to speak um to draw things to a close right and yeah sorry i'm i am mindful of time um and i'm still hoping that 
people will be able to stay around for a little bit of general discussion. But the one thing that I really do want to say um, is I'm so struck by the timing of this launch during this COVID moment. And of course, it started 18 months ago, but it feels to me that this is more important than ever because what's happening now is such a disruption to higher education and what we're seeing and what I'm seeing and what really frightens me is the way that big corporates are rushing in and offering free um, education which we know is not free at all and is, is hooking people in and so growing this community at this moment in time feels like growing an alternative narrative because we're all going to be thinking about how do we move higher education forward at this time of terrible austerity. And so the work that's been, been done and been exemplified in the special issue seems to me to be foundational. So it stopped being an academic project and become something that actually speaks to the heart of higher education, it seems to me. So it really struck me when I was looking through those final papers yesterday that this is this is not just a, a special issue. This is actually part of something much bigger and much more important. Um, and at the same time, the process of putting this whole thing together has been incredibly valuable. Um, it's been about community building, which, which links back to my point about this, this, this alternative narrative. And it was so funny because we had this mentoring idea which was really about, oh, well, if we put out this quite niche topic, we're going to get all these people from the global north and they're all going to be established and so on. And we want to make sure that's not the case. But what was really interesting is everybody asked for some sort of mentoring. Everybody feels the need for some kind of critical friend, some kind of engagement. And so the mentoring process was really revealing in terms of the diversity of engagement. And one is very mindful that mentoring is political. You know, it's a set of power relations and it's a credit to the three mentors that we had that they were so flexible in terms of responding to what people asked for. And as Sarah also mentioned, what was quite fascinating was the fact that several people asked for assistance after the peer reviews came in. So they started off going, no, I'm fine, it's all good. Um, but that peer review process actually kick-started another set of conversations and I think that was really important and, and um, contributed to the wealth of, of um, the wealth and the richness of the papers. And then as I, I mentioned in the chat, I think one of the strengths of this is the fact that we have such a diversity of methodologies because that's a form of inclusivity. And at a time like this, I don't think we have the luxury to be fighting with each other about methodologies. I actually think there's a bigger, there's a bigger challenge ahead of us. So, with that uh, uh, pair of scissors, which of course is an open uh, image, I just want to end by thanking everyone. Um, I wanted to thank all the authors by name, and then I realized that I would completely mess up the pronunciation of so many of the names, which is <laughs> probably a good form of um, the sign of the inclusivity of the, the range of authorship. I'm just going to thank everyone. There are a number of authors, of course, who didn't speak today. We asked for volunteers and some people couldn't because of time zone issues, but of course their papers are there. Um, I also wanted to thank Jaime and Martin particularly for loving the idea and going with it. And Vicky and Tim as well for their patience with us and the various you know, processes and backwards and forwardsing. The mentors who I've mentioned were so responsive, uh, Sarah, of course, because this has been very much a, a, a two-person facilitation process. And then lastly, Hewlett for trusting the idea. I mean, I don't know about a funder who says, yeah, we'll find some discretionary money to try this out and to pay for some extra article process in charges. So thank you, Angela, for actually believing in this. I think you've heard from people today how, how important it's been. And now I think we can all admire that cutting of the scissors and officially declared. I've never done this before. No one's ever cut a ribbon. So here's my virtual cutting of the ribbon that the <laughs> journal is officially launched. We <laughs> Thank you.
you so much, everyone. Um, uh, the virtual ribbon has been cut. That is so absolutely gorgeous. And um, as much as I love looking at that image, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can have a little more of it to, to see and hear from um, people who are here and might um, want to ask some questions. So we can maximize our um, Brady Bunch style um, interface. <laughs> Now, I will confess that it took me a while to be able to juggle all of the pieces there and it, it was, um, um, I saw a few questions fly by, but not really that many. Um, Laura, was there anything from the chat um, that you wanted to, to raise in terms of questions or should we open the floor uh, to, well, maybe open the, um, the chat to questions and then we can pick things yeah, up yeah, out I of the chat. Yeah, I think it's open up. Yep. I think let's open up, but uh, the one interesting question there was about was peer review and mm. whether it should be open or not. So I think that's, uh, I think people might want to raise that. Otherwise, let's just get a sense of people's impressions. Um, um, absolutely. Um, just in terms of practicalities, um, the way we worked with Jime was decided to do an ex a call for extended abstracts. And I just did a Google form for all of the applicants to to submit their abstract and then we embarked on the process of of feedback of those abstracts and the evaluation and the subsequent you know offers to write and um you know receive mentoring we, we just did that laura and i as a sort of front pipeline of support um all in the sort of google docs environment and and when we had papers ready that's when we invited authors to to jump onto the gyme system and so that's how we were able to um sort of um have our own little electronic pipeline of um, conversations and contributions and so on um, before we we hit the sort of formal process and the necessary blind peer review and I will say um, with that we had just the most beautiful reviewers um, I had I had a number of reviewers I would reach out to when when there was a dead t a timeline and someone had said you know perhaps oh, I'm really sorry I, I can't do that but and I reached out to a few people and said look this is a special issue on this topic um, I'm really needing needing some help on this for review for this I really think this is your thing you know and I had just people going my god that's a great paper I'd love to review it and and so it wasn't just this beautiful community of authors and there was a lot of the authors that we worked with in that pre um, submission phase um, but also the peer review I found just um, beautiful and astonishing and then as Laura sort of discussed the mentors ability to then um, engage with the peer review feedback and some of the authors so it, it just it was at each time a beautiful community building process and and the support that we received from each of the people behind the scenes was just phenomenal yeah all right questions who wants to put their uh, just jump in turn the mic on and go do i need to uh, release anything i'm trying but <laughs> um how do i you don't need to do anything i think everyone yeah. can unmute themselves can unmute just usually themselves? when it's a large group yeah, it's just when it's a large group of people. Go ahead, Caroline. Can Caroline, do it. Yes, please. Um, yeah, hello. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to say something that is maybe not a very scholarly question, but um, I think for me, um, the whole academic process of writing and understanding, and I need things more on the experiential manner, I think. And being here, I just got really really deeply in me what a good literature review is and it's about talking with all these wonderful authors and people that you know that you know and that you have heard and that you see them here and it's all really so human it's all so inclusive it's all so it, it's you know it's really walking the talk and yeah i was just thinking um, um when you have master students doing the lit review this is what you will advise them and and it's all so clear and so it's so not fake i don't know how to explain it but it's just wonderful and i'm so touched by all what i heard and and it's yeah it's just really 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 wonderful this <laughs> it's uh, about people being the ultimate open education resource right uh, i've i've been 
<laughs> saying that one and I, I'm quoting, um, I keep trying to uh, cite Catherine and then on <laughs> Twitter, she's like, no, I don't think it was me. So well, someone who said people are the ultimate open educational resource, please stand up. Um, because Suzanne and I, yeah. that's Suzanne and me. Oh, Suzanne thank goodness. Help us OER. <laughs> Suzanne and Maha, absolutely. It is see it, it's real right you just had it triangulated from from caroline in a different set of words that's beautiful thank you so much to all of those comments self as we are that's right um wonderful who else would like to um make a question or a comment i just want to real quick give a shout out to both sarah and laura who have managed this process beautifully um this was I, i'm an author and this was my first and hopefully only solo authored paper ever. Um, and it was, they were just really great in terms of working with me and, um, you know, sort of a, a unique article that I came up with and they were just really willing to let me be um, sort of creative and flexible. And I just really appreciate all of the help um, that you gave in terms of uh, making this issue just incredibly special. And I'm sure you did the same for, for all of the authors. So. Oh, that's nice to hear and lovely to see you. And I just briefly saw your dog's schnout and I wanted to give them a virtual, yes, the thumbs up, the dog lovers, hello, um, a virtual pat. And um, yeah, I, I found Amy's work inspired by the Hidden Figures movie um, and doing the content diversification study of the impact of changing um, content in a textbook to be more um, gender. It was genders your lens for your project, was it? Or was it wider than that, Amy? Um, it was so a, like, a little wider than that. But, a little yeah. wider than that. Yeah, in a psychology text. Um, I just found that, um, again, a really important um, preliminary pilot study um, of a sort of quasi-experimental nature about student perception of that. So I think we're going to see more of those types of things. So we're really proud to have your paper um, adding a lot of value in this. And um, I think you said to me, open education is not your main lane in your mind and that's an right and this is where we're coming from all these different disciplines and if you don't get this kind of support I think you know it can feel like you just feel like an imposter I, I heard this a lot you feel like an imposter from another field but what what is open education if we can't make it open to other disciplines because how can we get the richness if we're stuck in our own lanes literally and physically and metaphorically so really great to have you thank you any who else would like to dive in i see so many smiley faces the dogs <laughs> the dogs making me smile hi oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> he's beautiful um just to echo on that too amy you make a really good point and it was a really really amazing process to have someone just to be bouncing ideas back and forth including yourself sarah like it wasn't just this one-off thing or this remote kind of there was all kinds of modalities that we were using in the mentorship process and it, it it was really kind of practicing open practice that we'd like to do with our students, but have it done with us. And it was a really, I think, um, a testament to that lifelong learning um, idea that we could do everywhere across whatever we're doing. I and mean, then Susan also said, you know, we, we might be doing social justice, uh, but we never really called it that. And that was something that I also realized um, when I started looking into that literature, I had my head in so many other books um so yeah it was a beautiful um way to broaden my horizons so thank you all of you you're very welcome do we have any um oh uh, here's another thing um how many um phd candidates did uh, sign up for this marvelous process and who have currently <laughs> passed their viva tuskeen johanna Amy, Carolina, I, I think, and um, for those of you who, you know, the elephant in the room, I'm still waiting on mine being examined, so I don't even want to talk about it, all right? <laughs> but it was beautiful to be able to support so many um, um so many PhD candidates who were just on these rich pathways and, and finding, um, you know, it took a while to kind of twig, I think, through the process that there was a number of people at various stages of their study. So that was um, also, I don't know, it makes you feel that you must take also a lot of care. So um, 
and there was the camaraderie too, you know, occasionally I would just sort of go under a rock for a period and when I'd emerge, you'd be like, ah, oh, you get it. <laughs> I've been under that rock. So yeah, <laughs> Caroline is, yeah, we're, there's, there's a number of us and um, those of you through it, uh, I'm sure feel great empathy for, for that. And perhaps um, the special collection did provide a timely opportunity for some of those um, really rich studies. Yeah. Who else has got some reflections on this or questions? I just want to say something real quick. Um, first yeah. of all, anyone who finishes their PhD during a pandemic has to have like a special award mm -hmm. and in your alternative CV. Remember to write that down because that, that <laughs> shows so much more resilience than a normal human being would have. <laughs> and, and Sarah, what you, the fact that you, co-edited a special issue like this one and it's a mammoth special issue while you were still working on your PhD you're a warrior so I just that's an, another level I mean I'm, I'm sorry I mean Laura Chernovich is really experienced but someone who's working on their PhD and to also do this at the same time that is tremendous and to also then do this extra effort of organizing something like this which I know was not easy for you is um, it, and, and it's made such a difference to all of us to be able to be here together and celebrate something in the midst of these times yeah, it it's did. Else. It Thank did. So I think um, my uh, um, craziness, you know, it was a crazy thing to do, but it was just, it was just such a burning, passionate thing for me as part. It actually was an extension of, of my thesis studies. It, it, you know, my own studies were showing how under um, um, representative social justice views were in publications, but they're so present in the conversations we were having as practitioners at conferences. And I'm like, why is it almost impossible to cite a justice-based paper in this field? I'm like digging high and low for my own studies. So, so it was actually quite a, a personal thing. And in the end, although there were a couple of points where it was difficult, I found this project gave me great joy and gave me great energy to finish mine it actually all of you have helped um the energy that that i gave out came back in so many ways I, I just feel so um proud and happy the whole process has been just tremendously energizing i'm i am um i guess just that kind of crazy person what can i say but i did have a small rest afterwards she said <laughs> Um, Sarah, right. before we before we end, um, when I was talking, I didn't realize that Aras is actually in the audience. So maybe he, he would like to say hi to everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the fact that he's here. And um, um, he sure, lovely. I can see the waving now. Yes, um, <laughs> it's all right. You know, uh, Suzanne told everything about the article. I just want to say. Good morning from my time zone. Good afternoon mm. and good evening, whatever you are, mm. wherever you are. See you later on. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, guest editors, uh, they really did a great job of this. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yes. Take the passion forward, says Laura. Absolutely. I, I think that it, that may be the note that we, um, that we end on. So, um, Moving forward, I'm sure there'll be a sort of a social, um, social media sorts of Twitter type of activities, um, sharing these papers. Um, Maha, you made a glorious suggestion about annotating, um, annotating um, things. Sorry, a few disruptions. You know, in we could do like one a month for the next year type of a thing, and it's very tempting. We probably just <laughs> the organising could be curious, but you know thanks again and let's be sharing this work and citing this work and 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 reading this work and and being lifted up by it um supported by it let let's you know use it to sharpen our our thinking um and our conversations um and make this a, a truly useful um set of papers um and that will just be the ultimate compliment um i think yes I'm done. Who pushes the goodbye button? <laughs> Angela, do you want to say something before we go? No, just thank you for, um, for including me. I'm so glad I was able to be here for, uh, this, for this conversation. It's wonderful work and I look forward to continuing to learn with all of you. Fantastic. Um, 
I'm going to stop recording. Um,